I'm going to go give you a quick overview of transactions and concurrency control. Uh, it's going to be super short because uh, Hadoop took more time than I planned. I'm sorry about that. So the notion of transactions is something which I hope most of you would have heard of. Uh, it's a, a transaction is a unit of program execution that accesses and possibly updates multiple data items. Now a transaction might run within a database. It may have external actions also. Our focus here is going to be transactions within a database. Uh, transactions which have external actions are discussed in the book. You can go read it up. Now, if everything runs perfectly, there are never any failures. Uh, the job of transaction processing is a little easier. But in reality, failures do happen. Uh, so you have to deal with failures. For example, this transaction, transferring $50 from account A to account B, this is written uh, in a schematic way. Read some variable, some account A, subtract 50 from it, write to it. Similarly, read B, write B. This is not actual code. In reality, this would be a select uh, balance from account where account ID equal to some number. And then this would be account, up, update account set balance equal to this value where account ID equal to something. We are abstracting away those details and just saying A is an item which we have, we have the identifier for it. So if there's a failure in between reading A and writing B, we have subtracted from A and not added to B. That means money has been lost from the bank system. That's not acceptable. If you flipped it around and did B first, added 50 to B first, then subtracted 50 from A, a failure that occurs in between can result in money added to B but not subtracted from A, which is also a no-no in a bank. So that failures have to be dealt with. You have to essentially undo any partial things which were done to clean up after a failure. Another issue is concurrent execution of multiple transactions. We'll see that. So we will use this uh, example of fund transfer, the same one. And with respect to this example, atomicity means that if the transaction uh, starts, uh, it may fail in between. But the system should clean up such that it appears as if the whole transaction executed or nothing happened at all. So in other words, the transaction should appear to be atomic. How do you do this? Uh, you have, like I said, you have to undo partially reflected effects. The next thing is durability. Uh, by the way, atomicity is in, in the sense that an atom was considered uh, indivisible. It's the smallest unit. Of course, we know atoms are, are divisible um, today. But atomicity here means that it's indivisible. Uh, durability means that once a transaction is executed, the database cannot forget about it. So the transaction has done the, these two writes. Supposing there's a failure after this, and the database says, uh, forgets the whole thing. Some user is going to be very unhappy. They did the money transfer, but now the database has rolled it back. Uh, so the, once the database says, yes, I have completed your transaction, it should never forget about it. Until it says, yes, I have completed, it's possible that it may, a failure may lead to forgetting about it. But once it has confirmed that it has finished it, it's called committed the transaction, it cannot lose the information. There's also a consistency requirement. Um, for example, in, in the banking system, a consistency requirement is the total money in the bank should be, should add up to zero in the bank's accounts. What I mean is, uh, if they take money from a person, and add it to the account. Now they just added money in the bank. So they actually do this double entry bookkeeping where uh, you know, they keep record of something else which says minus that much money. Don't worry about the details. Uh, but the bottom line is whatever transaction happens, the total money in the bank should be the same. Uh, and uh, that's a consistency requirement from the application. That is enforced by the application, assuming that the system will run transactions atomically. Other things are primary foreign key, which the database enforces. But it can't enforce uh, this kind of thing. Some of A plus B is unchanged. Now, a transaction must see a consistent database. During its execution, the database may be temporarily inconsistent, meaning we have added uh, 50 to B, but not yet subtracted 50 from A or the other way. Temporarily, this requirement is violated. Uh, but once the transaction completes successfully, 
uh, the database must be consistent again. And the idea is that your transaction logic must be correct and enforce this consistency constraint. As long as it sees a consistent database coming in, it will leave it in a consistent state. That is the job of the application programmer. The database can help by enforcing some constraints, but the rest are up to the programmer. The next is the isolation requirement. So, uh, isolation uh, you can understand when you have two transactions running. So, here is this original transaction. It subtracted 50 from A, wrote it, and then it is reading B and sub adding 50 to B and writing it. Supposing while this is running, a new transaction came in, and exactly this point, it read A, read B, and printed A plus B. If you look at the result of this transaction, you can make it is clear that the sum of A plus B is not preserved. Okay. Um, in this case, I am just saying A plus B, but if you had, uh, you know, supposing both were your accounts, and uh, in the midst of this transfer, you ran a query which says, what is my total balance? The transfer should not have affected your total balance. Before and after the transaction, your balance will be the same, but if it read it in between, your total balance is going to come out wrong. So, this T2 has seen an intermediate state of T1. That should not happen. Isolation means that no transaction should be able to see a database state where another transaction has run partially. It should either have finished or not run at all. You can easily ensure isolation by running transactions serially, that is one after the other. But that is very inefficient for reasons we will see. So, bottom line is uh, that any database system uh, should support the ACID properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability. For lack of time, I am going to skip the rest of this slide. I have already explained what is in there. And uh, some terminology, when a transaction starts, it is active. At some point, it, if everything goes well, it will say, uh, I want to commit now. At that point, it is said to be partially committed. Now, the database will take certain actions to uh, remember what all it did. And once those actions are done, it will say this transaction is committed. But while the transaction is running at any time, it may realize that it cannot go ahead because there is some problem. And at that point, it is said to be failed. Once it has failed, you must clean up after it, and then it must become aborted, which means it has been cleaned up already. Now, even after partial commit, if the system crashes, uh, when it comes back up, the transaction may get aborted. It may only if everything went fine will it go from partially committed to committed. I am going to skip some details. Coming back, why do we even want to allow transactions to run concurrently? If you have ever been in a queue behind somebody who is taking a long time to be processed, uh, you will know what it feels like. You will say, look, my uh, uh, purchase is just one item and this person is purchasing 100 items. Can you please take me ahead of him or uh, in parallel with him? So, that is the kind of situation which would happen in databases too. You have long transactions, then you have small transactions. So, if you are able to run transactions concurrently, you get two benefits. The first is small transactions, actually the second here, is that the small transaction does not have to wait for the big transaction to complete. And the net result is reduced average response time. The small guys wait less and everybody is happier overall. The average response time is reduced. The other part is that different transactions may be doing different things. One transaction may have asked for an I.O. and it cannot proceed until the I.O. finishes. But now the disk is busy, but the CPU is idle. Another transaction which uses the CPU could use the CPU. So, running things in parallel means that you can improve processor and disk utilization. In particular, today you have multi-core with many things running in uh, parallel. You have multiple disks. So, you absolutely need concurrent execution to exploit this. The problem is things can go wrong and we will see examples. And we need a concurrency control scheme. You want to control concurrent execution so that uh, bad things do not happen. So, to understand what bad things can happen and how we can ensure bad things do not happen, the first concept we need is a concept of a schedule. What is a schedule? A schedule is simply a sequence of instructions that specify the 
chronological meaning time order in which instructions of concurrent transactions are executed. So, let us uh, see an example here which will make it more clear. This uh, same transaction as before is T 1, it is reading A, subtracting it from A, writing A, read B and so on and finally, it says commit. Uh, it asks to be committed and commit here means it is done, the transaction has been committed by the database. Now, here is another transaction which is slightly different. It is reading A and subtracting 0.1 times A, that is 10 percent of A's balance is being subtracted from A and that amount temp is being added to B and then it commits. So, here uh, you have two transactions which if run serially there is no problem T 1 followed by T 2. So, this schedule is ok. Uh, note that in a schedule I am not showing two operations running at the same time of two transactions um, and that is a simplifying assumption. In practice when you have multiple cores many things can happen actually concurrently. Uh, there is a lower layer uh, thing which the database handles mutual exclusion to shared variables to make sure that if two people want to access a shared variable, only one of them can access it at a particular instant of time. So, you can actually have stuff happening concurrently here, but if you have uh, two operations on A, okay, uh, say uh, this is writing A, this is also writing A, there is some lower layer which ensures that both of these will not happen together. Okay. So, at the same instant. May have, this may happen and a second after, not a second, uh, nanosecond after that the other write A may happen. So, there is an order there. Okay, so, that is uh, the assumption. So, this is a schedule, it is a serial schedule. Here is another serial schedule where T 2 ran first and then T 1 ran. Is the final result going to be the same? It is not. Here A has the initial value and you are taking 10 percent of the initial value and transferring it to B. Uh, here uh, you are then subtracting 50. If you use this schedule on the other hand, A has already been subtracted, 50 dollars have been removed from A. So, temp is 10 percent of A after removing 50 dollars. So, in this case temp is 5 dollars less than in the second case. So, this schedule actually transfers more money from A to B than the first schedule. So, the net result of this schedule with T 1 followed by T 2 is different from T 2 followed by T 1. So, uh, again I think I did not mention it, but time goes this way. This is the first thing which happens, then this, then this and so forth. So, the final result may differ, but there is no concurrency issue here. Both of them uh, are serial schedules, so both give a correct output. May not be the same output, but both outputs are correct. Now, uh, take the same schedules and let us say they are interleaved like this. This one read A, uh, updated A wrote it. Then this thing came in, read A, got the value of temp, updated A wrote it. Then this came in, read B, wrote B, then this did it. Is this schedule safe? Okay. It turns out that it is equivalent to schedule 1, that is the schedule where T 1 runs first, then T 2. Why? If you see the this thing reads A, which has already been updated by T 1. So, this in this schedule, the A value which it sees is the same as if T 1 had completely executed, including the update to B. And, uh, uh, so, the final result of this is the same as schedule 1, which was this one T 1 first, then T 2 is schedule 1. Okay. So, coming back here, this is equivalent to schedule 1. So, this one is fine, the final result is the same, the intermediate values which it reads, temp and all are the same, it is equivalent to schedule 1. And you will notice one other thing um, that if you see what uh, look at these two operations. This is write A, this is read B. In this schedule, write A happened first followed by read B. In schedule 1, it happened the other way. Uh, because T 1 fully executed before T 2, read B happened before write A clearly. Does that matter? And the answer here is it does not matter if you consider just these two. If you flip the order, you do read B first followed by write A, 
it has no effect at all because they are writing and reading different things. Similarly, if you take write B and uh, write A, the order is irrelevant because they are writing different things. How about read B and read A? Actually, reads do not conflict. If, even if both of them read the same thing, if you flip their order, the net result will still be the same. The problem is when one is a read and one is a write and they are both touching the same item, then you have a problem and we will see examples. So, this schedule is fine, it, there is no problem. Now, let us come to a schedule which actually has a problem. This is schedule 4, which read A subtracted 50 from A, but it is not written A yet. Meanwhile, T 2 comes, reads A, uh, computes temp, writes A and proceeds. Now, this guy writes A, but what value does it write for A? It this value, the original A minus 50. In between, T 2 has come and subtracted from A and written to A and this right here clobbers that. So, whatever update this did is going to be wiped out and the final value of A was the original value minus 50. On the other hand, what is the final value of B? 50 is added here and then temp is added to B here. So, we have a problem. The net result is uh, not even preserving the integrity constraint that A plus B should remain unchanged. Furthermore, it is not equivalent to either of the serial schedules T 1 followed by T 2 or T 2 followed by T 1. This schedule has a problem. We should not allow it. And if you look in terms of conflicting operations, if you try to move all these operations down, uh, this has a read B, this has a write B. If you try to swap the order, the result would be different. Here it read the old B. If you moved it down, it would read the new B. On the other hand, if we uh, try to uh, you know move these operations up above, uh, this has a write B, this has a write B. If you move this up, the final result will change again. So, neither of uh, th this cannot be essentially you cannot swap operations to turn it into a serial schedule, meaning T 1 or T 2 are the two possible serial schedules here. You cannot do these kinds of swaps to make it serial. Okay, so, that brings us to the notion of serializability, meaning a schedule which is not serial, but is equivalent to a serial schedule in some way. And in what way is it equivalent? There are two ways. There is something called conflict serializability and there is another called view serializability. We are going to skip this and our focus today is conflict serializability. Before we define it, uh, I am going to do one more thing. We are going to ignore all operations other than read and write. If you saw our schedule here, it had many operations. It had A equal to A minus 50 and so forth. Now, it turns out from the viewpoint of conflict serialization, we, you know, the database has to do something to enforce this. These operations might be happening inside an application. The database has no idea what the application does. All the database knows is the application read some data and it wrote some data. That is all it knows. What happened in between, it has no idea. So, anything we do should be based only on the read and write operations and that is our focus. This is not strictly speaking true. If you have an SQL query which does something, the database actually knows what it does. It is not just the read and the write, but our focus is going to be on read write. SQL query can be thought of as doing several reads and several writes. Now, we come to the notion of a conflict. Um, so, two instructions or one of them by one transaction, another from another transaction. They conflict only if both of them access the same data item. Let us call it Q, does not matter which data item. Both of them access the same data item and one of them is a read, one is a write, they conflict. It could be the other way. The first one is a write and the other is a read, they conflict. If both are writes, they conflict, but if both are reads, they do not conflict. What do I mean by conflict? What I mean is, if I had a schedule where this ran first and then this ran. If I try to flip the order, if write queue happened and then read, the result that read sees will be different. I cannot change the order in the schedule. Similarly, for this write and this read, if I flip the order, the result will change. Write, write, the final result will change. If this went first, it will have the final, it will define the final result. Uh, sorry, if this goes first, the final result will be whatever this wrote. On the other hand, if this goes first, the final result will be what the other one wrote. 
read read do not conflict, they can be swapped. That is the basic intuition and that brings us to the notion of conflict serializability. So, if a schedule S can be transformed into another one by a series of swaps, we say that the two schedules are conflict equivalent and in particular, if a schedule S is conflict equivalent to some serial schedule, does not matter which one, as long as there is a serial schedule, what is the serial schedule? First run one transaction, then another, then maybe others one after another. If a schedule S is conflict equivalent to some serial schedule, we will say it is conflict serializable. So, what we have just done is actually a very, very deep concept, you know, it may not seem that way, uh, but it is actually very deep. You will really understand this if you consider, um, you know, the state of the world before these things happened. People would write programs, parallel programs and kind of hope they worked. And if you do something, you do not even understand what could go wrong. In fact, this is kind of the situation outside of the database world. Who else writes parallel programs? Many people. When I say parallel programs, I do not mean parallel queries, they do not have conflicts. I mean things which also do updates. Many people write such things. Uh, Hadoop is not an issue. Hadoop is designed for queries, not for updates. Um, but many other systems, including device drivers and operating systems and other such stuff, uh, they do stuff which is inherently parallel. And they have had a lot of problems with concurrent accesses to data structures. And there are a lot of bugs. In fact, uh, Windows was notorious for crashing. And at the end, it, you know, Microsoft found out that most of those crashes were not caused by the Windows code, but rather by device driver code which other people wrote. They were buggy and they caused, they made Windows crash. So later on, Windows, uh, you know, there was a project there to uh, detect bugs in driver code, and they refused to let you put a driver at least pre-installed unless it, that program uh, passed those verification tests. And uh, there was a group in Microsoft Research which came up with these ideas and they really saved Microsoft space. So Microsoft is very grateful to that group in research because after that, the number of crashes for Windows dropped drastically. These days, you think of Windows as a relatively stable platform unless you get viruses. In the absence of viruses, it rarely crashes, very different from the olden days. So anyway, the point is that doing stuff concurrently is very difficult to deal with. Things can go wrong. In the context of databases, the notion of schedules helped us understand when something is bad and when something is acceptable. So conflict serializability is a key condition. If something is not conflict serializable, we say it is bad. So we have understood conceptually what is required. Um, the next step is for the database to have a component called the concurrency control manager, whose job it is to ensure that the schedules which get generated are conflict serializable. And we are going to briefly see how that is done. So for you to understand the notion of conflict serializability better, let us take one more example, a few more examples. Here is an example, uh, which actually models a schedule we saw earlier, read A, write A then T2 does read A, write A, read B, write B, and then T2 does read B, write B. Now, let us do these swaps. Read B and write A, can it be swapped? Yes. We will move that one step up and this down. Now, this read B and this read A, uh, A no conflict. Both are reads anyway and they are in different data items. So, now this read B has moved up above both of these operations. Now, let us do the same thing with write B. Write B, write A, different items, no problem, move it up. Write B, read A, no conflict, different items, move it up. So the final result is we have read A, write A, read B, write B, followed by read A, write A, read B, write B. This is a serial schedule with T1 first, then T2. So what we have shown is that a series of swaps can turn this into a serial schedule, which is this one. So this one is serializable. Now here is an example which is not serializable. Read Q, write Q, write Q. Now, can you move this write queue up? If you did, uh, the read, the value this reads would be different. So, in fact, both are on the same data item Q. One is a read, one is a write. So, they do conflict. You cannot move it up. On the other hand, can you move this down? The conflict theory says that both are writes on the same variable. They conflict, so you should not. And the reason is, if you did 
swap them, the final value of q would be different. Right now, the final value is whatever t3 wrote. But if you move this down, the final value would be whatever t4 wrote. Okay, so, there is a problem. This is not equal into any serial schedule. So, this is a bad schedule. We are unable to swap things. Okay? So, this was a situation. Now, here is a small quiz question. I will not bother using clickers. I will just let you think about it for a moment. Uh, here we have two transactions, read A, write A, and this one is doing write B. Question is, is it uh, conflict serializable or not? Or is it serial? It is clearly not serial because T 2 has an instruction in between two instructions of T 1. If it was serial, either T 2 would run first or T 2 would run after T 1 finishes. So, the question is, is it conflict serializable or is it not? And the answer is very easy here. These two are on two separate data items. So, they do not conflict. You can move the write A up and the write B down and you have a serial schedule where T 1 runs first, then T 2. In fact, here you can do another thing. If you compare read A and write B, they also do not conflict. So, you can move write B up so that you get a schedule where T 2 runs first followed by T 1. So, this is interesting. You have a situation where there are two different serial orders, both of which are equivalent to this schedule. And the point to note is that there is really no conflict between this transaction and this transaction. So, the order in which they run really does not matter. But if there was a conflict, the order in which they ran would matter. Okay, the last uh, two concepts which I want to focus on. The first one is recoverable. So, here let us see what happened. Um, read A, write A. At this point, T 8 has not yet committed. Meanwhile, T 9 reads A. So, it read the value which this wrote. It commits. It is done. After this, T 8 reads B. Okay. Now, let us see what has happened so far. Uh, is this serializable? If you see read B and read A, you can move read A down. So, it is serializable at this point, but T 8 has not yet completed. Supposing T 8 commits now, there is no problem. This schedule will be equivalent to a schedule where T 8 ran first followed by T 9. The problem is T 8 has not yet committed. What if it aborts? Why will it abort? Maybe the system crashes at this point. So, it cannot complete T 8. It undoes, it has to undo whatever T 8 did. But now, see what has happened. T 9 read something that T 8 wrote. And after a crash to make T 8 atomic, we are undoing everything T 8 did. So, T 9 has seen a database state which we are pretending never existed. That is bad. Okay. So, this schedule is not recoverable. If a failure happens here, T 9 is in trouble. This is not a recoverable schedule. So, we only want schedules where even if a failure happens, there is no problem with respect to other transactions. In particular, uh, you can ensure this by avoiding reading anything which is not committed. Here what happened? The problem is T 9 read data written by T 8 when T 8 has not committed. So, if you read uncommitted data, you are in trouble. So, you should not allow that. Another uh, less problematic issue, but still an issue is a cascading rollback. So, here is a schedule. T 10 has uh, you know read A, read B, write A. It is not committed yet. T 11 has read A, written A. It is not committed yet. So, it is okay. If T 10 aborts, you can abort T 11. Now, T 12 has read something that T 11 wrote. Uh, if T 11 aborts, it is okay. You can abort T 12 also because it is not committed. So, this schedule is recoverable because neither of these has committed. So, you can make a schedule recoverable by postponing commit operations. However, the problem here is if T 10 fails, uh, T 11 has to abort and in turn T 12 has to abort. So, you can have many aborts. So, that is not desirable either. All of these problems can be avoided by not reading uncommitted data. All the problems came here because you read a value which is written by T 10 which is not committed. So, basic principle do not read uncommitted data. Um, let us skip. Uh, yeah. So, cascadeless schedule is one where cascading rollbacks cannot occur. Uh, and 
uh, any cascadeless schedule is also recoverable. Um, so, to let us see by an example here, consider this schedule read A, write B, this one is write A, read B. What can we say about this? Is it uh, conflict serializable? This is different from cascadeless. Now, how do we check this? Can write A and write B get flipped? These are two separate things. So, write A can move down, write B move up. So, it is equivalent to a serial schedule where T 1 runs first followed by T 2. If you try to swap the other way, move T 2 up uh, first, it would not work because T A is first and then uh, read A is first followed by write A. So, it is conflict serialized. Okay. So, concurrency control is a mechanism which any database should ideally provide, which ensures that uh, schedules are serializable. Now, it turns out that while this is a good goal, most databases provide only an approximation to this. If you insist, they will give you ensure serializability, uh, but in practice, uh, in order to show that their database gives better performance, uh, most databases actually compromise on serializability and offer something slightly weaker and we will see that. So, there is something called weaker levels of consistency. Uh, the motivating things are, there are motivations for this. Supposing you want to get an approximate total of all balances, you want to get a rough idea of how much money the bank has, you want to add up the balances of all accounts. Um, so, that uh, can be done in a way which is not serializable, maybe that is acceptable. Then statistics for query optimization. Statistics include how many tuples are there, how many distinct values are there. And maybe you do not care about getting an exact value for this. It is okay if you do this transaction in a way that it is not serializable. If you insist on serializability, that may block other transactions and affect performance. So, uh, people do use this and the SQL standard recognize the need for it and said in SQL serializable is the default, which is actually a lie. Uh, well, SQL says it should be the default, but no database supports serializable as the default. You can ask for it, but it is not the default. Uh, then next level down, uh, well, let us start at the bottom. Read uncommitted means you can read anything including uncommitted data. Now, this is very bad because you can uh, read something which is then rolled back. We saw that that is a very bad idea. So, the next level up is only committed records can be read, but what it does not ensure is that if you read the same values multiple times, it can return different values. Why? Because you read a value once, it was written by one transaction which had committed. When you read it the next time, meanwhile another transaction wrote it, that also committed. The two reads of the same record would give different values with this level of consistency, read committed. But in fact, this is very widely used. This is the default which most databases support. But it's not serial. It, it can get you in trouble. The next level up is called repeatable read, which means not only should you read only committed records, but if you read the same record again, you will get the same value. Okay, so it seems very close to serializability, but it's not. The difference turns out that it may be that you had a transaction which inserted a record and inserted two records, let us say, and a second transaction might find one of the records, but never see the other record. Repeatable read only says that if you read that record again, you will get the same value. But it may be that it saw the first record, but not the second one. That does not violate repeatable read. But if they ran serially, this can never happen. If you read one record inserted by a transaction, you must read other records inserted by that transaction. It is impossible to see one, but not another. Therefore, uh, even with repeatable read, you can have non-serializable execution. Uh, so, SQL does provide a way to uh, uh, set the isolation level to serializable. And supposedly, once you do that, the database will guarantee serializability. It turns out that, you know, this, uh, I forgot to update this slide. The slide says Oracle and PostgreSQL by default support a level of consistency called snapshot isolation, which actually does not guarantee serializability. 
this slide is needs to be updated because as of uh, about a year and odd back, Postgres uh, actually supports, if you ask it to run in serializable level, it does actually run in serializable level. Earlier versions of Postgres would run in a uh, level which is not one of these, it's actually somewhere in between, called snapshot isolation, uh, which also does not guarantee serializability. Um, Oracle still does this, as far as I know. Uh, even now, if you get an Oracle database and tell it run in serializable level and then see what it does, it actually runs it at a different level which is not quite serializable. You can get into trouble because of that. Uh, so, uh, PostgreSQL also implements a, a version of snapshot isolation. Older versions also implemented that. The newer version implements a version of snapshot isolation, which is called serializable snapshot isolation, which fixes the problems with snapshot isolation. Um, ideally, I would have liked to cover snapshot isolation in great detail in the concurrency control part, but we probably don't have time. So I'm just going to skim over the details later today. Now, the last part of this chapter is uh, how do you control transactions in SQL? There are several things you can do. Uh, in According to the standard, a transaction begins implicitly and finishes when you do commit work or rollback work. In practice, all databases will commit a SQL query as soon as you execute it. You can turn off, this is called auto commit. You can turn off auto commit in JDBC connection dot set auto commit false. So if you're doing, if you're building an application which actually needs atomic transactions, you had better do this. You better turn off auto commit false, do the steps of your transaction, and then say commit or roll back if something went wrong. Otherwise, there's no guarantee that your application will actually uh, be uh, serializable. Even if you told the database run in serializable mode, um, the JDBC connection might still uh, run in auto commit. So that's that for this chapter. Mm, okay, there just uh, one question so far on uh, transactions. The question is, what is the difference between a serial schedule and serializability? As I said, a serial schedule is one where transactions run one at a time. Transaction starts, it runs till it finishes. Only after that, the next transaction can start. So they are running one at a time with no interleaving. One starts, it completes, only then the next starts. Serializable, on the other hand, does not imply that things are running serially. However, serializable means that it is equivalent in some sense to a serial schedule. And therefore, it cannot have concurrency problems because the effect is exactly the same as some serial schedule. Therefore, concurrency problems cannot occur. So our goal is to ensure that any schedule is serializable. We want to allow concurrent schedules to get the benefits of concurrency. At the same time, we want to ensure that nothing goes wrong. And to do that, we want to show that the concurrency control scheme ensures that the schedule is serializable. Okay. That was the only chat question. Uh, I can take one or two questions on AVU, only on serializability. Nothing else, please, at this point. Uh, Rajalakshmi, go ahead, please. We can hear you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, we can see, uh, we we have seen that uh, transaction can be run concurrently. So there is a concept called logs. So how can I identify which log is currently holding which resource? Okay. So I have uh, not yet come to locking. I am going to cover it in the next half an hour. Very, very, very quick introduction to locking. Uh, your question is, how do you know what logs are there in a database at a given point in time? Uh, so most databases provide some way to look at current logs. Uh, it's database specific, it's not a general purpose thing. Um, so there are tools, uh, front ends to Oracle, for example, which will let you uh, view logs stored for Oracle. Uh, PG admin, I don't think, uh, I don't know if PostgreSQL actually allows you a way to see what logs are being held by who. I'm, I'm not sure about this. Um, so I, I won't get further into that. Okay, so let's, uh, any other follow-up question? Thank you.
How to you, sir? Let me take a question from chat. Uh, please explain the problems of concurrency like dirty read, unrepeatable read and lost update. Okay, this is a good point. Uh, so, I said, uh, you know, supposing we uh, have non-serializable schedule, bad things can happen and I just gave some examples. Uh, so, people went around and said, like, can we classify the examples of bad things that can happen and came up with several of these. Uh, so, let me list those out since this question has been asked. Okay. The first one is dirty read. Dirty read is the same as read uncommitted value. Okay, and this is something which we want to avoid and the read committed level avoids this particular problem. The next problem is called um, unrepeatable, well actually lost update, I will come to that first. A lost update happens in the following scenario, you have T1, T2, you have an update by T2, write A. Supposing T1 does a write A here without having uh, a read A in between. Okay. So, what I mean by this notation is that if T1 read the value written by T2 and then it wrote A, that means it has taken the value written by T2, the, the, this particular write has been taken into account by T1. Supposing T1 did not do this what it has done is T2 has written something and T1 has effectively overwritten it. Without seeing what T2 did, T1 has overwritten it. Okay, so, this is an example of lost update. The update done by T2 is lost. Uh, so, you do not want this to happen. And the last one is unrepeatable read. Okay, so, of course, uh, we do not want this concurrency control technique had better prevent uh, this kind of lost update um, and locking is one way to prevent it. Uh, now, uh, coming to unrepeatable read, uh, supposing you had the following, uh, you had T 1, um, let us say write A commit, T 2 reads A. So, it has read the value written by T 1, uh, then T 3 comes and uh, let us say it reads A and writes A, commit and now T 2 again reads A. In this situation, the value that it read here, this is a read committed mode. So, this value was committed, it read that value. When it comes here and does the read again, the current committed value of A is this one, which T 3 wrote. So, it is going to read a new value for A. So, the first time it read A, it got some value, the second time it got a different value. So, this is an unrepeatable read. So, these are uh, symptoms which you can see, um, which uh, reflect the fact that uh, you are not running in serializable mode. So, if you go back to the slides here. Uh, the levels of consistency in SQL were defined taking into account these symptoms which can be observed, lost updates and so on. For lack of time, I am going to skip the details.